My name is David Pearl. I have a Welsh background, but my upbringing is in Canada, where I grew up in rural southern Ontario. I uh, have lived and worked in Swansea for probably most of the last 40 years, so part of my practice is still in Canada, where I teach and do a commission work. Principally, I'm working in glass and architecture, though I do photography and video and um, painting and have had exhibitions of paintings and photography and have used photography and video in my uh, architectural commissions as well. So my uh, practice is driven by working for architecture. I've got a training in architecture as well as fine art and I like working to commission site specifically. I like the fact that it's, it's for a client, it's for an audience and it fulfills a social role really in, uh, in the public realm. Glass I've found to be a, an excellent medium for integrating into architecture, especially since the principal concern of my work is very often to do with color and light. And the fact that it's a very animate presence in architecture and it has a very changing presence so that somebody visiting the same building at the same time of day even could have a very different experience at different seasons and in different weather conditions. And it's, it's, a, it's a living form rather than a static form. And that's what I like about working in architecture. I went to study fine art in, in Ontario and I uh, took a year off during that course to travel to uh, initially working in London, and then I traveled to the Middle East and India and Afghanistan and all sorts of places. And my friends recall that I stated seemingly out of the blue that I wanted to do stained glass when I came back from India and found that the, the college where I'd been doing painting courses and drawing courses before was now offering stained glass. And I got introduced to working as a stained glass practitioner at that point, uh, which is, uh, has very little traditional background in Canada. And I came to Britain and then specifically Wales to, to study at a dedicated or, or a specialist class course at the Swansea College of Art, um, which coincided with a period of a lot of interaction with German uh, contemporary artists working with architectural glass in architecture. And I just love the potential of the scale, the fact that you could work on such a big scale with, within a building and become part of that building is, is a very intoxicating possibility. Starting with painting, I suppose, does go back to my first major commission for Miss Den Abbey in Buckinghamshire, where I wanted this idea of the brushstroke. But at that time, we weren't working with enamels on glass. We didn't have any way of working on structural scale glass. It didn't exist as a medium. And um, it's been very interesting to be part of a process that's created a medium, that's created an approach to working in architecture. But at that time, we were pretty much stuck to working with uh, hand-blown French and German and some English glass. So I was using acid etching to try and keep and retain these, these, these brush strokes. So I realized afterwards this idea of working with the brush stroke, working with projected light and color into the space, have definitely become a, an ongoing thing. That, that narrative of projected light and color, almost in retrospect, has become a, a consistent theme in the work. One of the interesting things about doing painting is you, you're self-reliant, you, you produce the work, and you might find an interest outside that afterwards. But working in, with commission in architecture, you do actually have to establish that relationship right from the start. And it's always a changing one. The, the situation with the, with the building, the use of the building is different. And very often you face completely new and different technical challenges. The revelation of starting to do silkscreen printing on glass was, was quite considerable, that it opened those doors to, um, to working at a, at a structural scale in glass that can be tempered, toughened, and laminated. And I first explored it for a project I was doing for the National Film Board of Canada, which I did a uh, sort of maquette piece for. Um, and then I had the real first major chance to develop as a color piece 
for the Royal Conservatory in Scotland in Glasgow. We had to discover how to do things. And I think I've really enjoyed that process. That even went right through to doing the recent train station project. Because I want something from them that they can't do at first. And in that case, it seems to be something that would be terribly obvious. Is to produce something as absolutely transparent as this glass table is very difficult with enamels to do. And I like to feel that I'm still uh, experimental and not stuck in any process of trying to do what I did before, of thinking of new ways to move forward as you're, as you're working, is what keeps the interest going, I think. So at one point, at some point in my uh, practice, I decided to, um, to do a master's in architecture. Well, I aspired to. So I got in touch with, uh, just out of the blue, I was in London, I went to a phone booth and phoned up Peter Cook at the UCL, at the Bartlett, who is the very prominent uh, architect from the, primarily he had made a big impact in the 60s and 70s as a pop architect and influenced a whole generation of, of people. And he's still practicing, almost 90 now. And uh, he invented this idea of instant buildings and floating buildings and walking cities and all these fantastic ideas. Well, anyway, I got him on the phone. I came over and he said, yeah, it'd be great to have you on the course. But there were a lot of problems because I didn't have the requisite background. Everybody's qualified architects and everything to do a master's. But he thought I had an interesting and reasonably relevant background. So I forgot about it for some months. I was camping in Canada with my canoe on my truck driving around, heading to Snake Island to visit some friends. And I had a phone call out of the blue, and it was Amber. And she said, you've got accepted onto the course at UCL. Um, and I said, but that starts in two weeks. I can't possibly do that. That's, no, no. Of course, I was totally scared to death. <laughs> and was for the whole masters, actually, because I often felt really out of my depth, and it really kept me on my toes. Um, but Amber found me a place in London, and, and two weeks later I was plunked down in London starting this course, which actually proved a very interesting, uh, uh, partially a diversion, but partially a refocusing on finding my place in the work and understanding much more about contemporary architecture and what was going on. Because some of my architecture, projects in architecture, like this church in Toronto, you don't actually see what I've done. You only see the results of it pouring down these tall, cast-in-place concrete walls. That the, the color and light just moves around the building on the walls. You don't, you don't really quite see where it's coming from. And that was an exciting project to work with. And in that case, I was actually working on the design team. So there was an architect, myself as an artist, and a landscape architect, all conceiving this building together, which was a part of this um, uh, passionist movement of Catholics who believe that uh, the created world is an ongoing creation and that they like to see the outside world and effects from the outside world. So they don't have a shut-in church. They have at one end, which was almost, I thought, going to be a problem, they have this big sheet of area of glass going onto a garden because they want to see outside. And I thought, I don't even know if this is going to work to introduce this color coming down the walls around. So um, that becomes then typical of a situation that I always now insist on doing, which is building a physical model of the space. Um, and if it'll work in a model, it'll work in, in reality. So it does become important to me to model. Because actually at some stage, the architects kind of wanted to back out. They thought, mm, I don't know if this is going to work. And I had to go directly to the client and kind of had this box, this funny looking model. And I put the lights on it and they saw the color coming down and they said, yes, we've got to have this color in it. And now the architects say, well, that's the making of the project, you know, that they had that. And I say, well, yeah, you didn't want it though, but <laughs> in the end, but it's all right. I did some more work with them. It, it was, uh, sometimes that process goes like that. The process never starts the same. I think it's a familiarization with the people and the site and the architecture and and trying to think what would be a, a way to start. One of the startling things about um, 
the, probably the biggest project I've ever I've done, definitely the biggest project I've ever done, was uh, completed a few years ago in Toronto for a large train station, transit station, subway hub. And uh, the architects wanted me on board right from the start. And a lot of the things that are in this building are there because they said, well, we've got a square skylight. Do you think it'd be better over? Oh yeah, definitely be better with an ellipse. So I was working in that and the client said, oh, we can't afford this big skylight in the subway station. They said, well, the artist has picked that as a site to work in. Oh, well, then we'll have to leave it, you know? So in a sense, the art became almost a driving factor in the, in the design of the building, which was really interesting for me. And um, I, they said, well, it'd be nice to see some ideas for, for this. And I, I went home and I was based in Toronto at the time and I had a deck out the back of my place in Cabbage Town, an old leafy district of the city. And I started painting on glass directly with acrylic in the sunlight. So I would paint on the glass, or I'd smear the glass together, and I'd get it in the sunlight and take pictures and try this and put them together and take pictures. And what was interesting about this is that none of these things ever dried or became finished paintings. They were like recording a process that was incredibly transient. And I thought, well, this is a start, you know, this is kind of interesting, it's sort of a start. And I took it. I went to this architectural meeting in Toronto and it was, Adis was the practice from London and there were Akon, the different engineers there. And I showed them these things and I started with, and they said, that's great. That's great. We love it. I thought, no, no, no. I only just started. <laughs> and it was like, okay. Now, there were some additional things that happened, but that had set, that had set the direction. Because I was very much like the idea that Peter, I think Peter Cook said every architecture always starts with the hand, with drawing. And I thought, well, this piece of architecture is finishing with the hand and with drawing because that gesture uh, of the hand writ large in the architecture was an interesting record of the process of the hand because literally these, these small sweeps of color have become in some cases 50 meter wide uh, gestures of, of color and sweeps of color. So, um, and then they thought, well, maybe it'd be nice to have some glass on the side of the escalators. So I did things from that. Maybe it'd be nice to have this other glass. And so it really grew. So it became really a pathway of color and light through the building that uses a lot of natural direct sunlight and, and, and changes. Sometimes it's cloudy or sometimes in the winter, the sun's barely up or in the summer, it's very high. So it's super dynamic. It's not a static way of working, which is my enduring interest with, with, uh, with glass. Part of the interesting thing about understanding technical processes is, um, is to give you a vocabulary or, or a repertoire to deal with quite different situations if you can understand the medium enough. And working with uh, glass frit or glass enamel, silk screen onto glass, you, there are opaque and transparent enamels. And transparent enamels give you uh, transparency. They also give you good color projection into the space. But as soon as you start combining the colors together, you get, you get, you get problems of, of opacity and loss of transparency. And with opaque enamels, you get good light good luminosity, but you can't see through them. See, these are opaque enamels. So these are experiments for the glass that's going to go on to the escalators, because you need to bounce the light off the back of the steel in the background. Whereas here, I wanted people to actually see out the windows, because you imagine with colored glass that the eye is going to stop at the surface. And I was worried that that would create a slight claustrophobia that you're gonna, eyes gonna stop there. I wanted people to still see the buses and cars and everything through the window. Now in photographs, that's slightly hard to tell that's happening, but it's completely transparent. So it's like in one sense, it's not enough just to say you want this as a picture or something. You have to understand, you, you have your expressive aims that you might want to achieve artistically, but you have, do have technical issues that you have to know how to solve to, 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 to get what you want out of the project.
Um, one of the interesting things about the various processes I have with uh, working in different mediums is that it allows you not to bring one approach to a commission. So you don't say, it's not like this one solution. There's not a glass solution to every project. There's not, there's not a one size fits all kind of approach. So when I was, I was taken onto a team for uh, Alderhead Children's Hospital in, in Liverpool. The site was a hydrotherapy pool for severely uh, ill or injured children so that they, when they went into the therapy pool to create an environment conducive to the therapy. So another artist and myself and a sound artist, we worked together to produce a um, sort of video sound and light environment. In Canada, a celebrated uh, artist and filmmaker, somebody named Norman McLaren, who was celebrated in Canada for introducing the idea of directly working with paint on film. He actually painted the film. And, and I suddenly had this idea that with a, an iPad and with uh, uh, sketches or something, you could do a version of painting on film. So I, I developed a method of being able to, to work up images on an iPad, film them and edit to them and change the speed of them to actually create the, this idea of directly painting onto film, but in this case, directly painting onto an iPad, which became one of these 15 or 16 minute pieces. So it's almost like getting an excuse to explore something new that you haven't done before that a commission might might steer you into that you wouldn't have occurred to you or the need might not have arisen unless for the fact that the demands of that situation created that response. And that's a fascinating to not know what might come about by a process you get introduced to or a project or a site that you get introduced to. On a couple of occasions I worked with a Welsh writer and poet and encyclopedist Nigel Jenkins we worked in Princess of Wales Hospital in, in Bridgend, and it's a wall-based piece where uh, glass planks are laid along the wall with lights that project the text onto the wall behind. But it was very much to do with questions of uh, people, the issues they're dealing with within the body, and uh, you know things about the fact that we're just made up of certain chemicals or all these different things, and some of them quite funny, so that people would, would have these things to think about as they went along this 10, ten meters of wall. So it's interesting to try and make something physically work as something with a dynamic of light and color and reflection, but also create a, a relevant content to that site with what I would call site-specific writing. And I think there's a lot of potential for that idea of sort of site-specific writing. So that was exciting to do that because you're sort of in charge of it visually, but you're going to get together and, and work out what might be appropriate for the, for the site. So that's, that's a fun thing to do. You know I've got a piece in the Tower of the Ecliptic down the waterfront there, right? It was built as an observatory tower as part of the developments in, in Swansea. And I was commissioned, again, it was an artist and architect team. And I got to do the uh, sort of circular skylight in the, in the top. And the idea is you go up an access tower by, by stairs, you wind your way up, and then you go across to where the, um, the, the telescope is. So I very much wanted to create a feeling that you'd kind of already sort of left the planet when you walked in there. And so this is a combination of blue glass, cut out metal, and a kind of filter that changes color depending on the angle of the light. So it became like a, a, like a process, like a ritual that you would wind up closer and closer to this thing till you, till you get there. I was very influenced by the kivas of the uh, native Hopi Indians in southwest United States, where they built these, these dark womb-like spaces with a little square of light in the top and a ladder out. And so you would process from the dark to the outside world or to another world. And they thought that was uh, kind of recreating the process of us growing out of the earth into the light. And I thought, 
like you know, somebody, I'll think about these things like the tower or like versions of this processing up towards the sort of cosmos. So it's nice to have these little imaginings that you can realize through the, through the projects, I guess. Yeah. I think what really still animates me about the medium is just how physically exciting it is to get it to, to work with, to build it into a building and how, how lucky and fortunate you are to have that opportunity that people would vest that um, confidence in you to let you build something into a building. I was been talking uh, to a potential client today where you say, you know, where most art projects, you know, you, maybe you're going to have to change them at some point or you might move them around or you might hang something else there. Well, this is there for the life of the building. It's built for the life of the building. It's part of the expression of the building. Now, you do get works removed from buildings and you think, oh, I didn't think that was <laughs> going to really happen, but it does happen. But it's, I think it's, just so exciting a, a medium to, to work in. Because funnily enough, one of the funny things that I say, but I think it's true, is I don't really like glass itself that much. I don't like glassy things or bobbly things or pretty goopy glass blown things. Or I just, I hate it in a way. But a lot of that unpleasantness of the, for me, of that nature of glass is absorbed, is by the building. So you don't think about it that way. You just think of it as a light filter, as a color filter. It's a, as a physical effect in the building. It's not celebrating itself as glass so much as, uh, as what it can do in its environment. And I still think that has a lot of potential and a lot of ways that that, that can develop. It's, it's hard to get tired of that because you turn every project into some new exploration. So I don't feel I just do other glass designs or do this or do that. I'm really looking for a kernel of, of an idea that's, that's relevant to the space that allows me to learn something. So, you know, you do that yourself. I'm interested in, in a lot of subjects, but it's nice turning that learning something into uh, producing a work out of it, producing a work of art. So that's, that's hard to get tired of. So I look forward to doing more of that, really.